Good morning, people. Hopefully Good life. morning, James. How's it going? <laughs> All right. How are you doing? Good. Um, we have a quiz that opens tomorrow and is due Friday, and it's all on module 12. Okay. With those random variables. Sure, let me take a look here. Um, let's see. Module 12, uh, okay, I'm in module 12, cool. Um, just one sec, I have the organization here, I'm always, okay, module eight, module nine, okay, cool. Yes, random variables. Great. Already where I was at. Excellent. So let me take a look real quick. That's so 35-ish pages worth of material. Okay. Great. Um, so okay. Um, let me think for one second here. And while I think, oh, let me let me pin my video. I'm not sure you can pin my video. There we go. Um, there's some 16B stuff in the background. Um, actually, not really. It's 16B stuff that isn't in the syllabus that one of the professors is doing. But um, so there is the attendance and the link to the tutoring as usual. Also, there was something else. One second. Sorry, brain. There we go. Okay, and here is the link to the office hours this afternoon. Not that you can't access that somewhere else, but just wanted to throw it out there. So, um, yeah, random variables, module 12. So I guess my plan will to be, will to be, will be, once the quiz opens up, I will go take a look at it and try and kind of maybe do it to see what it looks like. So that then if you guys have questions, you're certainly welcome to ask me about them. And as I've done for my other classes, I'm happy to do kind of like little videos of problems that are similar, but not too similar to the quiz problems. Just so if you're struggling with something, I can kind of give you an idea of how you might proceed without just straight up doing the problem. Um, so let's look at module 12 a bit. I know someone had asked me a question already, so let me actually get to this one specifically, and then I'll kind of bounce around and see what else we're looking at. Um, Let's see, where is this question they asked? Okay, so someone had asked, I wrote it down, um, about this salesperson example. So this is on page 152 of your textbook, and I'm down at the telemarketing salesperson, the, learn, the first learn by doing on that page. Um, and so here's the example. The number of sales that a tell, and I can share my screen with you, ha <laughs> ha, how about technology? Um, also, I saw that nobody's favorite Harry Potter movie was The Prisoner of Azkaban, which I kind of found disappointing. It's one of my favorites. Maybe not my very favorite, but definitely up there. Anyway, back to the math. So this learn by doing example says the number of sales that a telemarketing salesperson makes in an hour is a random variable x having the following probability distribution. So the probability of zero sales is 10 50ths or 1 -fifth. Probability of one sales, 12 50th, two sales, 12 50th, three 10 50th, four 10 50th. So the first question is, what is the probability that the salesperson makes at least one sale in an hour? So if we look, so we can either calculate this the hard way, say, okay, well, at least one is one, two, three, or four, and we can add all those up. And you get 12 plus 12 plus 10 plus six, which is 40 out of 50. I would say it's 12 50th plus 12 50th plus 10, right, which is 40 50th. Or you can do it the slightly easier way and say, well, probability of making at least one sale is the complement of the probability of making no sales, right? So the complement of at least one is strictly less than one. And if you're talking discrete, strictly less than one means less than or equal to zero. So you can say, oh, well, it's going to be the complement of this probability. So one minus 10 fiftieths is also 40 fiftieths. So that's another way you can look at that one. Um, and then there's a second, so I'll be honest, I almost never do these ones where you have to like write stuff in there. Although you can just kind of write anything and then submit to compare and see what their answer is. That's what I've done when I've actually wanted to look at that. So if we look at this one, 10 minutes after the salesperson has started working, he made a sale. What is the probability this is the only sale that the salesperson made in the first hour? Okay, 
So the question they're asking there, and I think it's probably too easy if I write on the board. Oh, they've actually, they've, they've spelled it out here. Um, but um, one thing I don't like about cloudy-ish weather, and there's lots of things to not like about cloudy weather. I like cloudy weather mostly. I definitely grew up in a place where it is very cloudy, as Shelby knows. She also grew up in a similar place to where I did. Um, is that, <laughs> Sorry, is that the lighting in the room really changes as the clouds move. So like, it'll get really bright and then really not bright. So if you have trouble seeing things, just let me know and I will try to adjust. Okay, so yeah. Sometimes it gets too bright and it feels like a pregnancy. So the second question is, what's the probability that this is the only saleable pencil for something? So given that he made one sale, right? So when you have information, right, when they tell you something, and sorry, I should stop sharing my screen, you can see the board, right? Once you know something has happened, you should automatically set your mind to be in, oh, we're talking about conditional probabilities, right? We know something that is given information. We know that the probability we're trying to calculate has to be modified based on what we already know we're in this kind of subset of what could happen. So given that you made one sale, What's the probability of making only one sale? And at first, it might seem like it's the same, that it's still just 10 or no, that's not true. It might, so I suppose it might seem like the answer would incorrectly be 12 out of 50. So and let, let me throw up the tail together real quick. Uh, X, probability of X. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and we had 10 fiftieths, 12 fiftieths, uh, 12 ten sixths. Okay, so the wrong answer here is 12 out of 50. The right answer here, well, we already are given that he made one sale, right? So we can't have this happen, right? We are, this is not a null possibility. These are all still possible. So, right, so we're trying to find the probability that x is equal to 1, right, the probability that he makes one sale. Given that, we know he has already made one sale. Given that x is greater than or equal to 1. Right, because if he's already made one sale, it doesn't mean he has to make exactly one sale. It just means he has to make at least one sale. So now we're saying, what's the probability that What's the probability that this happens given that this could happen, right? That the x is bigger than equal to 1. So we're really saying, well, I just like to write this way. It's going to be 12 fiftieths out of 12, 12, 10, 6, 40 fiftieths. Obviously, the denominators cancel here, and we just get 12 out of 40, which reduces to, I think, 3 out of 10. 0.3. So that's how you would do a problem like this. Right? We have to say, oh, the thing that they're telling us has happened, that is our given in our conditional probability. Um, we can ask a follow-up question like, and I know there have been questions like this in the section, what's the probability, right, let's bring it up. So what's the probability of making Less that one right yeah. That's how they're making less than three sales. Oh, there's a spider right here. I'm sorry, spider, I'm gonna you're gonna die. Sorry, I'm gonna murder on the camera. I shouldn't be too that way anymore. Spiders are are welcome generally in my house, but not right now. Probably making less than three sales. Um, if he's already made one sale. Okay, so here it's the same kind of deal. Except now we're saying instead of finding the probability that x is equal to 1, we're trying to find the probability that x is less than 3 given that x is bigger than or equal to 1. Um, and also here is the, sorry, where'd you go? 
Man, everything all stuff's all over the place. One second. Here's the attendance and tutoring links again. Please fill out the attendance link when you have a moment. Um, so I'm trying to find this. I'm trying to think, okay, well, I'm already living in this given information that would be one, two, three, or four. So probably the x is less than three is really just these two things, right? If you're less than three and you're already bigger than or equal to one, well, you're either one or two. Those are your only options. Um, you can write it out this long way. You can say, oh, it's the probability that x is bigger than or equal to one intersect or and the probability that x is less than three divided by the probability that x is less than or equal to one. Now, that's the usual way of writing out these conditional probabilities. It's the probability that both things happen divided by the probability that the given thing happens. Okay. Well, this is exactly what we just said. So probably that x is, so, and this is where we have to be really, really careful, right? Being less than three does not include three happening, right? If you're making less than three sales, this is a dumb way to submit. If you're saying less than three sales, you should really just say, well, I'm making less than or equal to two sales. But they're going to phrase it that way because they want you to have to think about, oh, if it's strictly less than three, it's got to be less than or equal. So this is going to be, well, probably making between one and not quite three sales is one sale or two sales. So it's 12 out of 50 plus 12 out of 50, so 24 out of 50. Divided by, again, the probability, oops, I wrote this wrong. So x is bigger than or equal to one. Sorry about that. It is going to be, well, it's the same 40 out of 50 here. So here we're getting... 24 out of 40, which I think reduces to 6 out of 10, or 3 fifths, or 0.6, however you want to write that. So that's how you would calculate that probability there. Um, so let's see, let's take a look around and see what else we should look at from this module. Um, there's still it's kind of a big module. Sorry, let's see, we're on page 152. It's interesting that the pages, so this was the end of the probability distribution section in the random variables module. Um, let's look at the next section, which is mean and variance of a random variable. Oh, ah, darn, sorry, one sec. So, let's see. Let's actually go here for one second. So actually, let's go back to the example we were just looking at. Sure. So I suppose we could also, we could definitely calculate the mean and the variance for the number of sales made. So let's go ahead and do that. Let me rewrite this table because I kind of made it super messy. Again, I don't imagine your professor is really asking you many calculation questions. Um, so, but if we, we can write this out certainly. Ten out of fifty, twelve out of fifty, twelve out of fifty, ten out of fifty, and six out of fifty. So if I wanted to find what's the average number of sales, well, we would do the usual thing where you multiply each value by its probability and add it together. Right? It's the weighted average. So the mean here of x would be. 0 times 10 fiftieths plus 1 times 12 fiftieths plus 2 times 12 fiftieths plus 3 times 10 fiftieths plus 4 times 6 fiftieths. And if I'm going to do this calculation, I'm just going to think I know all my denominators are the same. It's going to be 0 times 10 plus 1 times 12 plus 2 times 12 plus 3 times 10 plus 4 times 6. 
which is, let's see, 12 plus 24 is 36, plus 30 is 66, plus 24 is 90, 90? Yeah, 90. Let me double check that math real quick. 36, 66, 86, 90, which is 9 fifths or 1.8. So we're making an average of 1.8 sales per shift, I think it was. Sorry, I don't remember what the exact phrasing there was. Double check. Oh, an hour, sorry. So we're making an average of 1.8 sales per hour. We could also calculate the variance. Um, although I don't, when we could, I don't feel like that's particularly useful. But I guess I should ask, should we calculate the variance? Is that something you guys think would be useful or not really? Yes, all right, cool. So the way we calculate the variance, and there's actually a couple ways of doing it. Um, I'm gonna erase this so you can have this here. So the mean is 1.8. When we calculate the variance, which is you know, sigma squared sub x or whatever your thing is, is it's the sum of your the difference between your values. So I people lose that like x sub i for our values, or these are the x sub i's minus the mean squared times the probability of x sub i. So this is going to look like, so our first value is going to be 0 minus 1.8 squared times 10 50ths. And so just before I continue with this, right, the whole idea with this is that the values that are further from the mean contribute more to the variance because if, if you have stuff that's further from the mean, it is saying that there is more variability in the data. So things that are closer to the mean don't count for as much because their difference squared is going to be small. Whereas things that are further from the mean are going to count for more because their difference squared is going to be larger. And then we multiply by the probability of that thing happening because again, the things that happen more should count for more and the things that happen less should count for less. So then we're going to get that minus that times that. Um, I'm trying to think about how do this. I really like fractions. I mean, really, we should probably just do calculators, but whatever. Um, so then it's going to be just the same kind of thing, right? It's going to be 1 minus 1 1.8 squared times 12 fiftieths, and then 2 minus 1 1.8 squared times 12 fiftieths. You can see it's just getting even darker and lighter in here, and then Three minus one point eight squared times ten fiftieths plus four minus one point eight squared times six fiftieths. All right. Um, yeah. So I'm thinking of zero minus one point eight as negative nine fifths, and if you square that, it's going to be eighty one over twenty five times ten over fifty, and then one minus one point eight is negative 0.8, which is negative 4 fifths. If you square that, you're going to get 16 20 fifths times 12 over 50, and so on. 2 minus 1.8 is 0 0.2, or 1 fifth. Square that, you're going to get 1 20 fifth times 12 50 fifths. 3 minus 1.8 is 1 1.2, which is 6 fifths. If you square that, you get 36 20 fifths. You're certainly welcome to tackle this calculation in whatever way you're allowed to. I would probably just use a calculator. The thing is you can't really, at least I'm not aware of a, a, way, a way you can um, enter this kind of thing into like some table and have it calculated for you. I think you kind of have to do this calculation by hand. But I definitely would like, I would be getting yeah, be like 1.8 squared times this and that's fair. So, Finishing this off, so that was 3 minus 1 point 4 minus 1.8 is 2.2, which is 
22 tenths or 11 fifths. And that's going to be 11 fifths squared is 121 20 fifths times the probability, which is 6 fiftieths. The nice thing about writing it this way is you can see that all of the denominators are the same. So I would just write this out as everything over 25 times 50, whatever that number is. It's 1250, I think. And then on top of that, 81 times 10, which is 810, and 16 times 12, which I can get a calculator, is 192. And 1 times 12 is 12, and 36 times 10 is 360. And 121 times 6 is 726, I think. Yeah. And then we add all that together. So 726 plus 360 plus 12 plus. Oops, I'm pressing the wrong button. It's not smart. Um, 192 plus 810. It gives me 2100 on top. Divided by 25 times 50, which is 1250, right? Right. And then we can either do it like that, or you could obviously do the division. You get 1.68, uh, which is so close to a perfect square. It's 0.01 off from being 1.3 squared, because 1.3 squared is 1.69. So, and the reason I say that is because so this is my variance. And the standard deviation is the square root of that, which is approximately 1.3, but it's actually 1.296. Well, I mean, it's a never ending decimal, but it's approximately that. So that's how you calculate the mean and the standard deviation here. So the mean is 1.8. The standard deviation, let's call it 1.2 for ease. So, right. So 1.8, and then if you go 1.2 to either side, you're going, so one standard deviation is going to give us about three, and minus one standard deviation is going to give us about 0 0.6, and then another standard deviation is going to give us 4.2, another standard deviation is going to give us something less than the net, than zero. So this seems, this seems like a higher standard deviation than I might have expected, because just going two standard deviations in either direction actually gets me all the data. And often we see that it takes three standard deviations in either direction to make sure you really have all the data. Not that you can't have this happen, just that it's somewhat atypical. Or it's totally possible I made a mistake in calculating it. I don't think I did, but you never know. Um, not like this, two like this, four fifths, one fifth. Well, let's see. Four fifty is fine. All right, just one point two two point three. Let me just check one thing real quick. In case you got one other time. No. Sorry, I just have to. I have to double check now. This was nine fifths. That's one. Oh, that's right. Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm convinced my numbers are fine. Um, so that's how you calculate the mean and the standard deviation there. Let's see, what else does this random variable module have to offer? Um, rules for means and variances, which I think I kind of addressed in the quiz from last week. Um, which makes sense. There's no clue. Wow, my hair looks extra special today. Yeah, it's getting long. Anyway, um, I haven't, I haven't, haven't decided whether I'm going to cut yet. I know you guys. There was a quiz or a, a poll, and people answered it, and people said my wife should cut my hair. Um, which maybe we'll try that. Anyway, looking at the module, I think I want to look at yeah. So yeah, we definitely had questions like this, like the questions about the bakery on the previous quiz. Um, talk about how, how linear transformations of a variable affect the mean variance and how adding two variables affect the mean variance. So let me cover that real quick because I do think it's something that could be asked about. And I think the one thing that 
everyone, I think, I think everybody got this one wrong, was how the variance of the addition of two variables work. So, or, yeah. So we have two different situations here. The first one is, and so I'm looking at page uh, 159 on your textbook. So if you if so if x is a random variable with a mean of mu, let's say mu sub x, and a standard deviation of sigma sub x, and the variance of sigma squared, obviously. Right. If your standard deviation is sigma, your variance is sigma squared. Yeah. So if we have something like some new random variable, let's call it capital, not capital, capital, let's call it capital Y. So if Y is equal to a linear transformation of this, so some A plus B times X, then the way that the things work is that the new mean of y, which I think your book actually kind of writes weirdly as mu sub a plus bx, which is fine, but a little bit cumbersome. So the mean of this is just, you're gonna plug in the mean of x for x, you're gonna get a plus b times the mean of x, which kind of makes sense, right? So for example, um, and let me just come up with some numbers real quick here. Sorry, it's, I'm trying to think of something reasonable here. I used cookies last time. I could say, so let's say that, ah, sorry, it's hard to come up with an example. Let's say X is brain, come up with something. Uh, X is the number of apples I bought at the store. <laughs> And Y is the price. And the price is given by, and this is gonna be kind of dumb because it's not very accurate, but whatever. Let's say the price is $1 for the, well, let's say 10 cents, because I have to pay for the bag and put it in my own bag. I don't, know, I don't think they're actually charging for bags, but whatever, go with it. So Y is gonna be 10 cents plus, the cost of apples, which let's say they're a dollar forty-nine. Uh, I don't apples are usually about a pound, but we'll say they're let's say they're ninety-nine cents an apple. Seems probably not realistic, but whatever. So there is our price function, right? So based on how many apples I buy, the price is going to be ten cents plus ninety-nine cents per apple. So if I bought three apples, it'd be 10 cents plus 2.97, which would be 3.07. So if I know that the average number of apples I buy, and I buy a lot of apples, let's say the average number of apples I buy is probably six. And let's say the variance is, or sorry, the standard deviation of the apples I buy is two, seems too high, but whatever. I probably do buy more like seven apples a week, but whatever. I like apples. Um, so if the mean number of apples is six, well then the average price is just gonna be what the price would be if I bought the average number of apples. So the average price here is gonna be 10 cents or 0.1 dollar plus 99 cents or 0.99 dollars times six apples. That's going to be six dollars minus six cents, which is five ninety four, plus ten cents, which is six dollars and four cents. So if I know what the function is for the price based on the number of apples, I know, and it's a linear function, then I know what the average price I'm going to spend, or average dollar amount I'm going to spend each week is, because I'm just going to take the average number of apples I would buy, and say, well, what would it cost if I bought the average number of apples? Standard deviation also works nicely here. The standard deviation for y is just going, or you can write it in this weird way, standard deviation for 
a plus bx is just whatever the coefficient of x is, um, which is b in this generalized example, times the standardization for x. Sorry. In our example here, the standard deviation will be, let's see, so standard deviation for the number of apples I bought is going to be b, which is my coefficient of x of 0.99, which is kind of silly now that I look at it or whatever, um, times my standard deviation for the number of apples, which is 2. That's going to be 198. So for this, for this one, it's actually pretty straightforward, I think. To find the average, you just plug in the average to the equation you get it. To find the standard deviation, you just take your old standard deviation and multiply it by whatever you're multiplying the variable by. Um, in this one, it feels like they're almost the same because there are, they are almost the same. Right? The, price, the dollar price is almost exactly the same as the number of apples you're buying, which is like 99 cents per apple. All right. On the flip side of things, when you have two variables that are added together, it's a little bit different. Oh, also, um, somebody asked me somewhere, I don't remember exactly where, um, how they would know when to use a T statistic versus a Z statistic. And I feel like that probably came from the Ndari's class, I'm not exactly sure. But just to kind of answer that for you guys, um, the general answer for the for stat 13, usually the answer is use a t-statistic when your sample size is not big enough. I don't remember what the threshold is at the moment. I want to say it's 30, but I'm not positive. Um, but we'll definitely talk about that more when we get to it. But, but generally, very generally, use the t-stat when your n value isn't big or isn't big enough. There's also another condition which we don't encounter quite as often in stats 13, but you do encounter more in stats 100. Whereas that it can be if n isn't big enough to use the t statistic, or if your standard deviation for your population is unknown. So those are two times when we usually go to using the t statistic instead of the z statistic for z table. Um, so let's look at this other thing where we have the rules for the sum of two random variables. And these random variables can be completely unrelated. Yeah. So here's how it works. For x, we have a mean of mu sub x and the standard deviation of sigma sub x. The variance is sigma squared sub x. And similarly for y, which no, now in this case, y isn't a plus bx, y is just some other random variable. Mu y and sigma y and the variance is sigma squared y. So, not surprisingly, for x plus y, the mean of the new random variable x plus y is the mean of x plus the mean of y. Which I think again makes some sense, right? If you're taking two random variables and adding them together and say, okay, what's the mean, what's the average of the sum of these two random variables? Well, it's the average of the first one plus the average of the second one. The standard deviation is a little bit stranger. So in this case, it really does make more sense to look at the variance. So if we look at the variance for x plus y, the variance is equal to the variance of x plus the variance of y. And to be perfectly honest, I don't think they actually give us an explanation for that. And I would like to tell you that I could explain it to you, but mm, I can't. I mean, I could, if I, I, I could take, if you want me to, I definitely can in the future, but there's kind of some, there's some math here that we could definitely do. It's not super important. And definitely there is an assumption um, that, the events are independent. Yeah, so definitely we do have to assume that x and y are independent um, to be able to actually say that this is true. If they're not independent, there's some other factors that actually have to get added in here. In this class, I don't think we have to do all that though. So the variance is given by this, 
And so I want to be very, very clear. The standard deviation for the sum of x and y is not the sum of the standard deviations for x and y. Instead, it's more of a Pythagorean thing where you say, oh, well, the standard deviation for x plus y is just the square root of the standard deviation for x, of the variance for x plus the variance for y. So that's actually how you can do it. So if you, if you look back at the quiz I gave, look at the solutions, you'll see that you know, in the, that problem I gave you, the variance for x was, sorry, the, the standard deviation for x was 12, the standard deviation for y was 5, and the standard deviation for x plus y was not 12 plus 5, it was instead the square root of 12 squared plus 5 squared, which ended up being 13. So I could definitely see someone asking a question on a quiz about that because that would be something that's not hard to understand once you see it, but easy to make a mistake on if you're not ready for it. Um, and actually, let's just let's go ahead and look at the content of the book. I mean, I don't feel like there's a lot of this problem I'm going to show, but we can totally look at this. Again, I'm looking at page 160 here. So, sorry, one sec. Um, uh, everything's everywhere, sorry. So if we look over here, we can see that we've got the rules. And so then there's like, the did I get this? A big department store has two stores, one on Fifth Avenue and the other on Sixth Avenue. Number of shoppers who entered the store for 2,000 or more has a mean of 25, standard deviation of five. Um, and for the number of shoppers through the sixth avenue door, the mean is 35 and the standard deviation is eight. So then let the random variable t be the total number of shoppers who entered the store. And what's the mean of t? We just add them together, right? 25 plus 35 is 60. And then assuming that the stop that they are independent. What's the standard deviation of the total number of shoppers? Well, again, it's not going to be 5 plus 8, which is 13. It's going to be the square root of the sum of the variances. And the variances are 25 and 64, right? Just squaring both of those standard deviations. And then the square root of 25 plus 64 is the square root of 89. So that's how we're calculating the variance there. Let's see. Um, let me look more at this module. There, if people have other questions, that's really fine. Although I imagine most of the people in looking my hair, I'm like, whoosh, it's all like, whoosh, got the wave. I'm sorry, I'm like trying to look at my hair and like it's all backwards because the you know, video is backwards. Um, yeah, it's spectacular. Really, really great. Sorry, I can't help talking about it. I will try to refrain. I know it's not the concern for everybody. It just it looks wild today, so I keep seeing it, like, oh yeah, I look ridiculous. All right, so um, let's see. Those are rules for mean and variance. Binomial random variable. Let's take a look at that section. Let me take a look here. Why aren't you there again? Okay, yeah. So let's look at. Okay, yeah. Okay, this one always kind of throws me off. I always, I kind of tend to forget. So if you've got a binomial random variable with n and p, then oops, sorry, let me scooch this over just a little bit. So I'll make a tiny bit too close to my space. Um, Chair to the way. I was going to race the other side. But... So, um, so, binomial random variable, random variable, and again, right, this is the, the kind of situation where. You're saying, right, you've got some thing that can either happen or not. So you've got success or failure. And P is the probability of success. 
So like if you're flipping a coin, heads, tails, P is one half, and one minus P or Q is also one half. And then we have N trials or trials that we call it. I'm sure. Or N repetitions of the experiment. Um, then the mean of the random variable X is going to be N times P. And the standard deviation, well, the variance, let's say first, is N times P times 1 minus P. And then the standard deviation is the square root of that. And for some reason, I don't know, I always seem to forget this formula. So this is definitely a formula that is worth knowing. Um, I feel like there was something in here that we needed to know. I guess not. I already did this little checkpoint here. So let's see if there's any kind of, let's see, looking at this checkpoint. So let's actually, let's, yeah, we got, we got nine ish minutes still. Let me share my screen with you guys for a second. So here's the checkpoint of the end of section, whatever section I was just in which is on page 165, um, binomial random variables, module 12. So you look at this checkpoint, there's just a few questions we can answer. So let's look at this first one. Blood type AB is the rarest blood type occurring in only 4% of the population. In Australia, only 1.5% of the population has blood type AB. So as a random sample of 50 US residents and 40 Australians is obtained, consider the random variables described below. So I'll admit, I definitely didn't get this one right the first couple times I did it, so um, I'll take a look. So X is the number of US residents out of 50 with blood type AB. Y is the number of Australians out of 50, 40 with blood type AB. And Z is the total number of individuals out of 90 with blood type AB. Which of the following is true about the random variables X, Y, and Z? Um, good question. So X is a binomial random variable with N equal to 50 and P equal to 0 0.04. That seems right to me. Like the n is definitely 50 for the US, and the p value, the probability of success, is 4% or 0 0.04. Why is my number random variable with n equal to 40 and p equal to 0 0.05? That also seems true. Z is my number random variable with n equal to 90 and p equal to 0 0.055. I don't believe that is true. The n would be 90, but I think the p value wouldn't be 0.055. I don't think we can add those probabilities together, right? In fact, if we think about it this way, so let's think about this way. For the first, so let me actually stop sharing for just a second. So for the first one, right, the average for the x would be n times p, which is 50 times 0 0.04, which is uh, 2, I think, right? 50 times 4 is 200, so yeah, twice is 2. And the average for the Australians would be 40 times 0 0.015, which I think is like 0.6. Let me double check. I always make mistakes when there's decimals, so it's always good to get 0.6. And using the rules from the previous section, yeah, I agree that that's A and B. Using the rules from the previous section, the average here should be the sum of the averages, which is 2.6, which is definitely not 5.5. So yeah, definitely not C there. Let's back to sharing the screen. So let's look at the next one. In the following random experiment, decide whether the random variable X is binomial or not. A sample of four cards is selected without replacement from a standard deck of 52 cards. So the without replacement part already makes me think probably not binomial because you don't have the same probability of the thing happening each time. Well, let's read further. In which there are 26 red and 26 black cards. Well, actually the number of cards that are red. So is that binomial? Well, let's see. So I can either get zero, one, two, three, or four red cards. I'm selecting 
right? Four cards, that's not binomial because there isn't the thing happens or the thing doesn't happen. So I would say not binomial. All right, colorblind, this is any, yeah, so there's a lot of reading here. So let X be the number of males who are colorblind, let Y be the number of females who are colorblind, let Z be the total number of colorblind individuals. What is the probability that exactly two of the males are colorblind? All right. I just need to read further. A random, uh, okay, a random sample of 20 white males and 40 white females were chosen. So we're kind of ignoring the females in this particular question. What is the probability that exactly two of the males are colorblind? All right. So, so this isn't hard. This is exactly just the binomial probability. So, stop sharing. So we have, right, we have a, for male colorblindness, it said the probability of that being colorblind was 8%. So we have a p-value of 0 0.08, we have an n of 20. The probability of getting exactly two colorblind people, or men, I should say, not people, males, is going to be, well, so we have 20 choose two, because there's that many ways, which is uh, what, 190, I think, 190 different ways of choosing two of the men. And then the probability that two of them are colorblind is 0 0.08 times, or squared. But then if two of them are colorblind, the rest of them have to be not colorblind. And there's a 92% chance of them being not colorblind to the 18th power. This is definitely a time for a calculator. I'm 22 shoot, 22 to that if you don't, if you're having a hard time finding the choose button on calculator, this one is relatively not awful. It's 20 factorial over two factorial times 20 minus two, or 18 factorial. And this reduces nicely. 20 factorial over 18 factorial, everything cancels except for the 20 and the 19. Two factorial is just two. 20 over two is 10, and then 19 is 190. Usually choose two is actually pretty easy to calculate. It's just the number times the next lowest number divided by two. So that's gonna be 190 times 0 0.08 squared times 0.92 to the 18th power. And then I would definitely use the calculator here. 0 0.08 squared times 0.92 to the 18th power to the 18th power and then that's 0 0.0014 times 190. So I'm getting point zero point two seven uh, one zero nine, which definitely corresponds to one of our answers, 0 0.2711. And then finally, this last one, According to the CDC, the rate of cesarean births in the United States in 2013 was about 33%. So a random sample of 200 birth is, births is selected. That X with the number of cesarean births out of all 200 births. What are the values of the parameters? I believe N is 200. I believe P is 0.33. Let's take a look. Okay, did I, did I get them right? Um, well, I think our answer is this attempt was submitted late, so I got zero percent. I still think our answers were right. Um, oh well, so I don't tell me anyway. Um, I remember also, let me go back. I know we're just about out of time here, but there's one other thing I did want to say to you guys because I know there were some questions on one of those checkpoints where they asked about like if your n was big enough to be. Oh, I think it was this normal random variable stuff. Sorry, I don't know. Mm, I don't see what I'm looking for. Um, what I do want to say is there were definitely questions about like if N and P allowed us to use a normal approximation and there were conditions about like I believe it's n times p has to be bigger than or equal to 10, and so does n times 1 minus p. So those are your conditions for using a normal random variable. I feel like there's one other thing that's also supposed to be true, but I am not. Actually, let me look real quick here, so I think.
Now, I guess those are the only two things that have to be true to use the normal approximation. Um, I feel like there's something else though. I'm gonna double check on that and maybe I'll send you guys an email if I find the thing I'm thinking of. Um, but that's about all the time we have. I'll remind you guys that, um, well, one, to, uh, to do the attendance, and two, we do have office hours this afternoon from 2.30 to 3.30. Um, I should also, just as a warning, I've also opened up my afternoon office hours to my 16B students since I wasn't having any, um, like rarely was anyone from SNAPS showing up, which is fine. So just so you know, they might also be there this afternoon if you decide to come. Um, I will still kind of answer your guys' questions first, but I said I would help them out because they're having a hard time 16B. So, so hopefully there should be enough time for everybody. But if you come this afternoon, just be aware there could be students from the other class. All right, that's all I've got. I'll try and find this binomial approximation thing I'm thinking about. But if you have more questions, feel free to drop by the office hour this afternoon. I'll see you guys later. Take care. You're all welcome. Bye. Oh, sorry, I just realized, let me do one more thing. I accidentally sent the attendance document privately. There, there's the attendance document again. Please fill it out if you haven't already. All right, and I'm gonna find this thing that I feel like I know is here. All right, I'll see you guys this afternoon or on Thursday or next week.